Welcome to the New Books Network. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'll be chatting with Van Goss. He is the professor and associate chair of history and program chair of Africana Studies at Franklin and Marshall College. We're going to be talking about his recent book, The First Reconstruction, Black Politics in America from Revolution to the Civil War. The First Reconstruction offers a series of case studies that explores Black voting in Philadelphia, New England, New York, and Ohio. Goss interrogates our assumptions about the franchise and reveals the largely untold story of Black politics before the 15th Amendment. So before we get started, I want to give you the opportunity to tell us a little more about yourself, maybe something we can't uh, Google or search for online. Oh, um, goodness. Um, I was uh, the founder of what somebody called Pennsylvania's first new wave band in the early to mid 70s, which dates me a lot, I realize. Um, It's not a great band, but at least we were, we got there first. (laughs) That is awesome. Um, So historians tend to write about specific periods of time, but You've written a great deal on the mid to late 20th century before coming to the revolutionary era and the early Republic. Um, So can you tell us a little bit more about the shift in your research? Um, Yeah. And that shift is pretty sort of, that's, that's the story of how I got, did all this, like, how did I shift? So I was, I I thought of myself as someone who was trained in post 1945 history. Um, And that's how I, you know, first to find myself when I started applying for jobs. And so this is what happened. My first book, dissertation, first book, Where the Boys Are, Cuba, Cold War America, and the Making of the New Left, had some, some meaningful African-American history in it, even though I had really not been trained in that. I had taken one kind of reading course with David Levering Lewis, which was a tremendous experience when I was at Rutgers, but I did not think of myself as doing black history. But that, the, the, the black history in my book on Cuba, which at the time, I mean, nobody had written anything about Cuba, hardly at all, and, and or about the really extensive um, solidarity in the African-American community in the late 50s, early 60s, which extended for decades after with the Cuban Revolution. So um, uh, I received a much more positive and interested response from not just people doing black history and African-American historians, but actually from African-Americans in general, like they really were interested in why Harold Cruz and Leroy Jones and Robert F. Williams and all these other people went to Cuba. Like what did Cuba mean? Because of course they knew African-American historians and the black community knew how deeply popular Fidel Castro had been and that he was welcomed into um, Abyssinian Baptist the last time he came to New York in the late nineties. Um, and the relationship of the Congressional Black Caucus with Cuba over decades. So um, I received a welcome. And then uh, one of my, I don't know, close friends, I guess you could say sort of a mentor, a guy named James Miller, great scholar of Richard Wright, who has unfortunately died a couple of years ago before COVID. Jim Miller hired me at Trinity um, in 1994-95 as a visiting assistant professor. And while I was there, Jim asked me to write an, an essay on Harold Cruz and the Cuban Revolution uh, for a book that he was doing with Jerry Watts on the crisis of the Negro intellectual revisited. Um, and that's really what got me going. Um, I, I, I you know, did what one does. I'd, you start researching and looking at things. And I discovered all of this sort of what I thought of as the prehistory untold about the Black Power Movement. And that's, this is stuff that I, I, I could write, I may write a lot more about this. Um, you know, that the version of black power that we've been told, of course, so much more has been done on this. People like Peniel Joseph have done enormous history on the black power movement, but in the nineties, there wasn't much. So I did actually write a really large article, which is when that book finally came out, the crisis of the Negro intellectual visited. It has, it starts off with a, a major article. I mean, for me, just because it was, I did all this research on Harold Cruz and where he came from. This is what got me started. Um, I received some crucial support, but I'm one of hundreds of people who have received crucial support from Robin Kelly, 
I'm not claiming any special relationship. He's just an extraordinarily generous scholar. And he, you know, sort of said, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll I guess, put it bluntly, he probably, his recommendations got me a few fellowships, maybe, because I could not get an academic job in the 90s. And I'm not portraying myself as a victim. I'm just saying I got, I didn't quite grasp the, grasp it at various places, which may have been my own fault in some way. Who knows? Um, so I started doing, as of about 1996, as when I finished this article in Harold Cruz, and I interviewed Mr. Cruz. A lot of people thought he wasn't around anymore, but I interviewed him and published the interview in the Radical History Review. So I was getting going between where the boys are and talking to Mr. Cruz. And I, I call him that because I retain enormous respect for him, however controversial he may be. I learned a lot from him, just um, his life and how he fought. So I thought between roughly 1996 to 2004, 5, 6, the next 10 years, I did uh, truly massive research on a book that was going to be called Black Power in White America that would start at the end of Reconstruction and go through, at that point, through the, uh, you know, 2000, let's say. And I still have all that research and I have, you know, detailed chapter outlines and everything. So I started writing the book around 2004, which um, did lead to that article in the American Historical Review, uh, As a Nation, the English Are Our Friends. So for eight years, approximately, let's say 1996, 2004, I had some fellowships. I finally got hired at Franklin and Marshall as a visiting assistant professor. I did a great deal of research um, on black electoral politics, party politics, from the end of Reconstruction, really through the end of the 20th century, um, but very much focusing on the period prior to 1936, a lot on that, on the fact that McCarthyism was not anywhere near as effective in the black community as anywhere else. Um, and I still have lots of things to say about this. If McCarthyism was effective, Coleman Young would never have been elected mayor of Detroit and become a Democratic kingmaker because Coleman Young was almost certainly either in or extremely close to the Communist Party. And this is no great secret. That's just an example of what I wanted to write about. So I start writing the book in 2004, 5, 6. And I had seen little, little brief indications here and there of some kind of black politics before the Civil War. Um, you know, and, it, and really the, the one notorious article by Dixon Ryan Fox from 1917 about the black vote in old New York. Um, that was the only article through the 90s that was cited very often. And I thought, well, I better write about this a little bit. You know, I, I need to acknowledge, I can't pretend that it started uh, in the, you know, the delegate elections in 1867 in the form of Confederate states. There was some, something going on. And, and some books had been written that I was gradually discovering. Um, Phyllis Field on the suffrage fight in New York. Uh, William and Amy Lee Cheeks on, on Ohio's black politics. They were good books. Robert Cottrell on Providence. I'm not the first person to ever do this. So in essence, I started what I thought would be a chapter and then maybe two chapters for the big book, Black Power and White America. And as so often happens in it just took off and I, I became bigger and, uh, and I, I had to tell my then publisher um, that I wasn't going to write the book they thought. And that publisher, which I will not name, that editor, was extremely unhappy. And eventually I had to, uh, anyway, this is, that's how I ended up writing the book. I discovered so much history. Every time I looked further, there was more. And I thought, if there is so much black political history from the 17, even the late 1780s, if you're talking about Boston, Prince Hall is leading his men to the polls in Boston in 1788. And it's widely noted. It's not like I had to, Jeremy Belknap, who's one of the first historians in American history, founded the Massachusetts Historical Society, noted it. So let me finish by saying this, right? Because you asked me this. In my experience, both with my book on Cuba, this, these things are not actually hidden. They're right there. That scholarship that I've cited, Robert Cottrell, The Cheeks, Phyllis Field, um, and 
probably a couple of other books that I'm not remembering right now. Those books were there. It's just that, you know, I'm, I'm not, you have to actually recognize what's in front of you and say, oh, it's, it's not true. Leon Litwack, who's, you know, spectacularly good historian, but do not take, since 1961, and right through the present, right now, somebody is footnoting Leon Litwack's North of Slavery, brilliant book, to say, oh, there was no meaningful black voting. But so, you know, you're, you're, a, you're, you're become, you are an historian, right? We, people listening to this, don't take somebody else's word for it. You know, go and look into it. That's my answer. Thank you. Um, I, I have to say I might have been a little guilty of that myself. So um, one chapter turns to two chapter turns to um, close to a little over 500. Um, so um, the title of your book, the first part is The First Reconstruction. I don't think that um, a lot of people who don't follow this history very closely, I don't know if they would understand what you mean by that, what that term means. Um, I'm wondering if you could walk us through that. What, what are you referring to? Absolutely. Yeah, the book has had <laughs> three titles, and I want to briefly, um, the first title for most of it's the time I was writing this book, the title was We Are Americans, which um, uh, the first chapter on the ideology of black republicanism before the Civil War, which is obviously a, a shout out to Eric Foner. Um, uh, I, I, I use that, I quote Henry Highland Garnett in 1840, his address to the people of the state of New York, um, which is one of the most important black publication speeches um, of the entire period saying, we are Americans. And then I point out that Frederick Douglass said the same thing in 1853 in his almost the same kind of address at the National Colored Convention, which I will note, we are Americans, directly contradicts the endlessly quoted, you know, what to the slave is the 4th of July oration. And I do actually say, you know, yeah, that's Douglas for a certain audience. I think we are Americans is more accurate in terms of Douglas and politics and Henry Highland Garnett's. So that would have been a fine title of the book. But um, at, a, at a graduate center workshop, where, you know, at your institution with uh, David Waldstriker and Jim Oakes and a bunch of other people, I had this little brainwave. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to call this book Native Sons because actually that is, again, very accurately represents the politics of the men, and they are men, that I'm writing about, that they saw themselves as Native Sons and as much American as anyone else, and especially more American than all these immigrants who don't speak English, or speak it with a very heavy accent, who are not Orthodox Protestants and have not served their country in wartime. So I like Native Sons. Now, my publisher, who I uh, have no complaints about UNC Press, terrific publisher, at a certain point, pretty late, they said, you know, we've been meeting and we think there's going to be a problem. If we call this book Native Sons, people are going to think it has something to do with Richard Wright and it's going to confuse them. We think you should call it the First Reconstruction which was then the title of the introduction to the book. Now, and I said, okay, now I see your point. My argument, which I think I arrived at independently, but has been made very effectively by Stephen Hahn, uh, you know, very important historian. And I quote him to back up my argument. Stephen Hahn says uh, that there was a first emancipation in the North that we should not think of emancipation as a process. The emancipation is 1863 on. No, there is a emancipation state by state in the North. And after all, for 30 years, we've been saying, well, it almost happened in Virginia twice, right? The 1790s and after Nat Turner. Um, it happens de facto in Delaware, despite Delaware remaining a slave state, 90% of African American, formerly enslaved people are legally free as of 1860, right? So think of emancipation as a long process from 1780 on, from when Pennsylvania passes its law. But there's a first emancipation, but there's a first reconstruction in the North, state by state, with very mixed results. You know, the first reconstruction in New Jersey uh, is pretty, pretty ugly, you know, pretty bad. Um, the first reconstruction in the main district of Massachusetts 
is about as close as you're going to get to Canada, meaning actual civil equality. So that's the argument. It's an intellectual argument, but it's also a political argument, which is to stress the deep continuities of this history. And I think that I'm one of quite a lot of historians who are stepping back from that very sharp, formal periodization. You know, you're a post-45 historian, you're a progressive era historian, you're an early republic, and you don't talk to each other, right? I'm one of the people who says, we need to start talking to each other because the continuities in U.S. history are so deep and profound that we are, we are participating in an ideological mystification if we deny them. That should be clearer than ever since the election of Donald Trump. White nationalism, the power of the white republic, is the through line of U.S. history. And the fight against that is the through line. And that's what I'm participating in. So, yeah, I think First Reconstruction challenges the reader to say, what? Oh, what do you mean? And say, well, have a look at the book. You know? So I'm so glad. Um, I'm so glad you... Um brought that up and addressed that so thoroughly. I have um, another question that I think we really need to address before we can actually dive into the book. Um, the first reconstruction is uh, political history, but I think it would be useful for you to define how you are defining politics um, for this book, because I think a lot of scholars are used to um, a broader definition and I think you're bringing something a little different to the table in the sense that um, you're very clear about what is going to be included, what exactly you're talking about, who you're talking about, and you're adhering to, I think, um, a pretty rigid definition of, not in a bad way, just you're very clear about what you mean by politics. Some of what I have to say on this is actually in the introduction that David Waldstriker and I wrote together for the edited volume we published last year, which, you know, clearly is pretty cl closely tied to my book, um, uh, Revolutions and Reconstructions, um, uh, which came out in 2020. And I put, I mean, David and I wrote that in introduction together, but you know, part of what I wrote, I mean, that he edited and so on, was a, a pretty uh, sharp and intended to be sharp and polemical confrontation, if you want, with the dominance of social history in our profession since I was a graduate student starting in 1985. And I was a graduate student at Rutgers, where social history was, was practically created in the U.S. in many ways. You know, uh, My department, of which I remain immensely proud, I, I'm, Rutgers is a great place to be, and I imagine it still is, actually. It was Rutgers that brought E.P. Thompson to the U.S. in 1966, way before anybody else. So I was trained as a social historian. And, and you know, from where I was, it, it was not that political history was completely ignored. After all, um, Dick McCormick, Jr. was there, and he was doing the new political history, which brings in a lot of cultural history, like paying attention to, you know, the politics of class, the politics of partisanship, cultural history, so to speak. But um, my perspective is that um, what has been done over the past decades and continues to be done is social political history with virtually everything except elections and parties and voting in the state included. So I'm going to say that again. Social political history focusing on movements and resistance and agency. And I don't use those words with any mocking because after all, I've done a great deal of this myself. I've published multiple books on movements, left-wing movements. That's what I did. So I do know this from the inside. I've even published books, an article, a major article that wasn't post-45 on the gender politics of the Communist Party, major for me, not major for anybody else. So I'm part I participated in that. And... I think at a certain point, I said, well, wait, why are we doing everything but, you know, elections and parties and voting and patronage and partisanship and the state? Why are we skirting the issue of the state and state power now? So, um, in fact, I think this is um, much larger significance. There is, it is, there's nothing secret about my political engagements. They're, they're extensive. 
and they may, and they're not especially distinguished. I'm you know a journeyman, but I've been very politically active for a very long time, and I am extremely self-critical of myself and other left activists because that is how I identify. Going back to the '70s, for how we as activists largely ignored party elections, voting politics, as something that was somehow we just couldn't go there. And I've participated in organizations and movements. We did plenty of protesting. We lobbied. We got arrested. We invaded congressional offices. We did all of that. But actually getting involved in parties, the Democratic Party, oh, no, 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 we didn't do that. So I think the history and the, the politi political activism, I don't think just for me, it was this idea that, that party politics was somehow not important, um, maybe uh, sound and fury signifying nothing. I'm not sure why. I've, I've tried very hard to get at why, uh, why, what, why we would have brilliant histories of just the period I'm describing, right? The early Republic, the antebellum period, that deal with literally everything as politics, sexuality, music, food, um, communities, families, labor struggles, physical space. You could go on and on, all of that as politics. But when we get to voting, there's not much, you know, that's left. I guess it's left to people who are self-described political historians who are definitely were not going to pay attention to the role of black men in party politics. So I'm, that's, I, I hope that, that kind of gets at it. Um, and I, I'm going to conclude this, okay? One more, uh, and this is, you know, a shout out to my fellow historians, but also to my fellow activists. You may not care about party politics, but it cares about you. If you stay outside of it, it's just going to come along and it's going to do things that you may not like. So it's not, and as a historian, if you choose to ignore that, you know, if you write a, a, you write a case study of a, a city or a town or a state, and as if it doesn't matter who's actually holding power, you're participating in something that is actually, I don't want to say reactionary, but you're maybe a kind of mystification, you know? So there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I want to turn to your third section on New York. One of the things that I found um, really striking um, was early on, you make this connection between Black New Yorkers um, during the during the revolution. You argue that historians have assumed the desire to disenfranchise Black voters in the 1785s was this racialist impulse, but that isn't completely accurate. Can you talk a bit about the revolution's impact on black New Yorkers and how that legacy reemerged in some of these early debates for disenfranchisement in New York? Sure. Um, it, it, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here, actually. Lots of people, Graham Hodges is actually someone that I learned a great deal from. I don't know him hardly at all personally, but he's not the only one. There's just so much good, good early Republic history, revolutionary history that I had to read all of. So at a certain point, it was like, it became clear. And I probably, someone else said this, that, you know, the British occupation of New York, the greater New York area, right? Made it actually a, a almost a, a revolutionary environment for African Americans. You know, they could engage in an armed struggle backed up by a powerful state against their oppressors. Um, this is not, this is well-known history, you know. Colonel Ty, the black guerrilla leader, the terror of patriot farmers in northern New Jersey. Patriot farmers who, you know, enslaved lots of people, used enslaved labor all the time, right? Craig Wilder's really absolutely crucial here. So uh, on, on uh, so, and, and economic opportunities, you know, the vast British army, they, they're going to be serviced. They're going to be going to provide foodstuffs. Uh, so this, this was a, I won't, certainly wasn't a utopian environment, but greater New York, up into, up, up the Hudson, out on the island, into northeastern New Jersey, was a, a uh, very fecund place for self-freed self African Americans. And that's why the very well-known story of, you know, Washington trying to convince the British, um, Sir Guy Carlton, the British general commanding New York, 
He returned Washington's own enslaved people, his own chattels and others, and Carlton saying, you know, no, I can't do that. That would be dishonorable. And taking 3,000 of, of them up to uh, Nova Scotia, which, of course, then it becomes much more complicated. And Shama, Simon Shama has a book on that rough crossing. So there's a huge historiography here. So my point is, now, the, the, um, what happened in 1785, the attempt to pass emancipation with disfranchisement and how that was defeated, some other people have dealt with it, but I, I, I think I went somewhat farther there by finding out that there was a very practical argument in the newspapers at that point that, you know, that along with the Quakers, who were notoriously loyalist, that African Americans in New York City had shown themselves to be, you know, friends of the enemy. And therefore, they should not be enfranchised because they'll, like the Quakers, vote against us, the Americans. And I thought, well, this is really, um, you know, this is part of the theme of the book. Disfranchisement in 2021 doesn't proceed from a racialist ideology. Of course, that's there. I'm not denying it exists. It, it, proceeds, it proceeds from power politics. You know, this is this is constituency that might that may be a problem for us or they're voting and we don't like how, who they're voting for. So we'll get rid of them. So that's another through line in American history. Um, but and of course, how could I forget uh, Shane? God, Shane. Thank you, Shane White. I was going to say Shane White. I mean, there's so much good history here. I mean, he points out and it's really distinct, noticeable that once you get up into the 1790s and very early 1800s, that New York City's black community is so militant. I mean, they, are, they, they, don't, they don't take anything lying down. They fight, they, they, they campaign, and I use all that into my book. Now here it's worth noting how really different they are from other free black communities, notably Philadelphia's, you know? And I am, I wanna say this, I'm not gonna name any names, I am unalterably opposed to histories of the free people of color in the North or anywhere in the U.S. that try to generalize across states. Do not do that. You, you will, you will, you will, there is no generalizing. Philadelphia is really, really different. It's more prosperous, apparently. There's more, you know, big fancy churches, as Cornish points out in 1827 in the Freedom Journal. But it's much, much more cautious. And you'd say because it's near the Chesapeake, but I don't think that's the only reason. So I think that the remarkable culture of freedom, if I can use that term, that, the, that matured under the British over eight years, 1775 or seven years, 1783, that that goes into the post-war period as a, as a militant fighting kind of culture. And that, of course, leads to this really extensive electoral politics, real balance of power politics that I described. You... You also revisit um, the legacy, I guess, of uh, Garrett Smith and um, the settlement program he had going on in upstate New York. And I personally found that um, just really striking and also incredibly thought provoking. So I'm wondering if one, you can explain to us what exactly was he doing there? Um, for those who aren't familiar. And also the literature has tended to focus on when discussing this, his paternalism or um, black resistance to um, re you know, this resettlement in upstate New York. But you're pretty clear that we don't know how many people held on to the land, but you suggest that it very well might be more than we've ever, considered, certainly more than I've ever considered. So um, I'm wondering if you could tell us what prompted you to resist, uh, revisit this. Um, let's see. I, I will say this. If someone is looking for a good dissertation topic or a book or whatever, they, they, this is just sitting there. It is, this is such a great topic. And there are, you know, articles and pieces and I, I, probably cite pretty much everything that's been done on it, but there is a full-length book to be done about um, Garrett Smith's um, settlement project in upstate. Um, so uh, the, the 1821 New York State Constitutional Convention 
widely regarded as the most important one between the revolution and the civil war. And, you know, in fact, let me be clear. I don't, I don't even know if I would have written this book without that remarkable collection by Quigley and Gelman, Jim Crow, New York. I was utterly blown away by this. I had no idea. It's, and it's such a great teaching book. I mean, there's all these documents. So the convention, um, uh, you know, they, they, they settled on a fig leaf so as to avoid a straight out full racial, racial disfranchisement. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time trying to get at why they went for this fig leaf. But the fig leaf was to take the existing $250 freehold suffrage um, to vote for the state Senate and governor. Until 1821, you had to own a $250 freehold. That's a substantial piece of land. Um, and it's not, it's not the New York City, if you pay rent on something worth 50 pounds, you can vote. There's all these things in New York. Um, and that had been true for everybody. So even in the, I think the, the gubernatorial election of 1820, only 38% of adult men could vote because of the $250 freehold requirement. So the convention takes it away from everybody and imposes it on black men to vote at all. Okay. And the intent is to disfranchise all, but, you know, literally a handful. And it's quite successful um, because that means that someone like Dr. James McCune Smith sitting in New York City, who, you know, by the 1840s, he's, he's a well-off man. I mean, he owns property, but he doesn't own a freehold. You could have stocks. You could have money in the bank. It's not, you know, a freehold is land. So Garrett Smith seeing this, um, Garrett Smith is one of, it's worth noting that the, this section of my book encompasses two of, without question, two of the richest men in American history as extremely strong partisans of black political power. One is Stephen Van Rensselaer, the last patroon, who is at, accurately described as the richest man in American history. Yes, more than Bill Gates in real dollar value. The last patroon, fierce advocate of black voting rights. And then there's Garrett Smith, who his father had been a partner of John Jacob Astor. So he owned uh, an, an extraordinary quantity of land all over New York State. And he didn't just own it. He actively improved it, traded it, sold it. He was, he was a serious, you know, entrepreneurial real estate promoter. And also, if you're going to start talking about bourgeois radicals, it's pretty hard to top Garrett Smith, you know? Uh, sort of, let me put it this way. Imagine, you know, taking Bill Gates and attaching him to Black Lives Matter to, we're, we're not going to just protest. We're actually going to defund the police everywhere in the country. <laughs> Doesn't that sound really strange? Well, that's kind of what Garrett Smith looks like in the context of the time, what he called Bible politics. So he's sitting there in 1845. He's got all this land. He's been building up, buying new land, especially along the lakes. He's just fabulously rich and he's really frustrated because the freehold su suffrage, even with men here all across upstate, Solomon Northup's father got a freehold, you know? Dr. Smith, Dr. James McCune Smith estimates there may be 2,500 black voters in 1845. And I think that's, there's every reason to think that he was accurate. 2,500 is, you know, nowhere near as many as there could be. So Garrett Smith says, I've cut all this land. I'm gonna sell off this land and um, to pay the taxes on it, because I owe all these taxes. And I'm going to ask the black leadership. New York has a massive black leadership cadre by the 1840s. Dozens of men spread across the state, meeting every year in convention. It's a very advanced political class. I'm going to negotiate with them and say, okay, they can't drink. They must be strictly teetotal, because that's really key for Smith and for a lot of people then. A lot of black leaders do, but can't have that. Uh, you find me 3,000 men. If I have that much land, I can, you know, pay off the taxes. Find 3,000 sober, industrious men, and I will give them this land that is worth $250 if they improve it, and they will become voters across these upstate counties, not just the Adirondacks. When people wiki this or they hear about it, it always sounds like it's the really, you know, really still today, really backwoods, barely developed. No. A bunch of these counties are not, are not Adirondacks. So that's the project, okay? The Smith Land Settlement, 3,000 empowered black farmers, and eventually John Brown becomes involved and so on. Um, 
all of the historiography says that um, probably not that many of the men moved onto the land because they were mostly city dwellers. They were Brooklynites. And, you know, going into way upstate, with it's very, very cold. The land isn't actually very fertile. It's pretty hard to make a living on it. That this was this was kind of a utopian idea, and you know you can I mean I I I use the manuscript census and I count and I say well in those counties actually the the population of free black men does actually double over this period these few years so there's more of them for sure how many of them were there ten years later I mean this is the book somebody should do it use the census the manuscript census to really get at it but that's not my key argument. My key argument, which is based on something that Smith himself wrote in Horace Greeley's New York Tribune at the end of this, it's just said, well, it doesn't appear that very many of them actually went up to my lands. This isn't successful. And then he says, in passing, um, only, about, only about half of them still hold their deeds. And I did one of those things we do where you sort of put two and two together and hope it makes five. I pointed out that exactly after three or four years of this, that suddenly the New York City electorate suddenly jumped drastically. Suddenly, there were enough voters in Manhattan to really count and to swing the entire Manhattan electorate, which in turn had statewide implications. And my conclusion, which is, you know, a surmise if you want, is, is that, you know, you, you've got this. It doesn't matter. You don't have to live way the hell up by the Canadian border. You've got the deed in your hand. You walk up to the polling place. The Whigs control that polling place. Because if it's Tammany, they're going to run you off, beat you up. You walk up and you say, here's my deed. And they say, okay, well, fine. You, you're a freehold. You vote. So that's my argument that Garrett Smith actually did enfranchise a whole lot of New Yorkers, even though they didn't become the archetypal, you know, independent American freehold subsistence farmer that everyone had been brought up to believe that we should be. That's the argument. So I want to um, move forward or I guess go back to the first chapter of your book, but stay on this um, topic just a little different. Um, we're talking about, you know, philanthropy in in a way, and we're talking about move um, movement. And I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about the American Colonization Society, which you talk about in the first chapter, and you describe it as one of the most powerful philanthropy philanthropies in the United in U.S. history. But one, I don't think most Americans are aware of this organization. And I also think in the historiography, many historians have minimized its sig significance. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it's actually a textbook case of how, you know, basically reactionary philanthropy is. If you, if you take philanthropy seriously, what it means politically, it, you know, it, it's, um, the closest parallel would be the massive drive for charter schools across, you know, my lifetime and yours, right? That, oh, you know, the, our schools are broken. Let's let private interests get rid of unions, uh, do any, virtually anything they want pedagogically, and somehow this is going to fix the problem of Jim Crow education and massive class inequality and um, class all tied up with racial um, uh, oppression and, you know, the larger immiseration of working people because of deindustrialization. So the charter schools was, like the American Colonization Society, a great nostrum, a panacea with deeply, I mean, profoundly reactionary results. American Colonization Society, founded by the, really, across a bipartisan elite, Henry Clay and Andrew Jackson together, um, proposed to solve the problem of a an enslaved African-American population that would grow 700% in 70 years, right? This is taking over the country. Somehow this problem would be solved by sending some unspecified number. This is how it's like the charter schools. No one's ever said, well, we're actually going to run the whole country by charter schools. I mean, it's a tiny fraction of students, and yet somehow this is the thing that's going to fix it. So the American Colonization Society um, proposed a kind of genteel form of ethnic cleansing. We will keep, we'll start just shipping African Americans, people who are typically three generations away from Africa, in most cases, back to Africa, um, where they are not welcome, where they don't speak the language. Um, Liberia was essentially a colony founded by the U.S. Um, 
chartered by the U.S. Congress as the receptacle of these, you know, freed people. Um, and over the entire, its entire, it actually continued after the Civil War. Most people don't know that. So over the entire 19th century, I mean, as a, it may have actually existed as a charity way into the 20th century, but over the entire 19th century, how many African Americans were more or less under the freely? I mean, often it was, I will emancipate you if you agree to go to Liberia. That was the argument made in North Carolina, Virginia. So you didn't have a lot of options unless you wanted to stay a chattel slave. 14,000. 14,000. While the, the enslaved population was going to 4 million. Nostrum doesn't even begin to get at what a ridiculous Ponzi scheme this was, so to speak, frankly. And yet, the American Colonization Society was supported by Congress, by many state legislatures, and by elites right into the 1850s at, an, at a, you know, bipartisan elites. So it's, it's out there as the great danger. And what is one of the things that's really striking is that, um, you know, African Americans knew it. They saw it very, very quickly. They saw their enemy. This is a way of denying who that, quote, we are Americans, a way of evading the issue, which is the extraordinarily rapid growth of racial capitalism as an imperial project going out to the Mississippi and past it, all this is going to be evaded by this thing that makes white people feel good, to put it bluntly. Now, there's one more piece of this, though. I don't know if I'm answering your question. There is an, a, a serious element of, you know, this is not a word I use in the book, there's a serious element of comprador, uh, collaboration here. You know, John Brown Russworm is a very important figure. He is, he's not actually the first black graduate of an American college. That's, uh, uh, Alexander Twilight, three years early at Middlebury, Alexander Twilight, who's then elected to the Vermont legislature in 1836. But people didn't hear about Twilight, even though he was a man of color. I mean, indubitably. They hear about John Brown Russworm up at Bowdoin in 1826. And then he founds Freedom's Journal the next year in New York with, uh, with Samuel Cornish. But a couple of years later, he says, oh, to hell with this. He goes off to Liberia, where he becomes you know, a powerful political figure. And, you know, some number of African Americans do take this option to go have some power. But unless I, unless I'm mistaken, this is a very ugly story that does involve racialism, the racialism of the American librarians over the actual African people living there. I hope that's, I, that's my understanding. If I'm yeah. incorrect, I, to my point of view, I thought, I, I thought this, the history had been done very well. I especially relied on Claude Clegg's book, C-L-E-G-G. -G. I've forgotten the title. I always remember them by author's name. Oh, it's a fantastic book. Um, so it's all the way through there. The ACS is this enemy pulling progressive, as we would say today, progressive white people over towards, as we know, Lincoln, right up till 1863, over towards, well, maybe, maybe, they, maybe they would like to leave. Maybe we could just help them leave. Um, so it's it's... A huge presence sort of around and outside the black politics I describe. So um, I'm wondering, what do you think and also what do you hope your contribution to the historiography on um, New York is? Or, um, yeah, and also black New York as well, black New York politics. Well, I think that, you know, I, I, in, at least for me, uh, maybe this is because, you know, after teaching for a long time, you, there's a certain point where you say, well, if I've really made a contribution, it will, you know, get into, in, you know, in a few sentences anyway, into the textbooks. That would show that you, people, you had changed how this is being taught. If it, and textbooks, I was a textbook editor for years in the 1990s, you know, to make a living for HarperCollins. So I got to develop textbooks, including not history ones. And, you know, there's a few things more... Um, conservative than textbooks, how much they resist actually changing. So in some general sense, it would be great if the textbooks started acknowledging that there had been some of the black politics that I described, as well as the civil rights struggles, to use an anachronistic term, that Kate Mazur describes in her book, Until Justice Be Done. And I mention this because Kate's book and my book are now being, for very good reasons, often discussed together and reviewed together. So um, if they were to say, oh, actually, there were like fierce anti-racist civil rights battles going on. Oh, and black men were really actively participating in the parties and fighting their disfranchisement and finding ways around it. 
you know, in Ohio and New York, which are the first and third largest states in the country in 1860, they have to a very large extent overcome form of disfranchisement. So that, that would be, that's what I'd like to see in the textbooks. You know, I could dictate the text for anyone who's writing a textbook if they want. Now, in terms of New York history, yeah, this is a dream, isn't it? In terms of New York history, um, I think that uh, I've had stepsons who went through, you know, excellent public schools. You have to t study New York history. I would like to see New York history. In, and in fact, you're giving me a, a reminder. Um, recently, my, my college, Franklin and Marshall, in the past eight or 10 years, we have become less, mo less monochromatic, if I may use a polite word, okay? We have finally have more first-gen students and students from the city. I taught there for 10 years, and hard, literally, I, I could count on the fingers of one hand the number of students that I had um, who were from New York City, which was really strange, you know? And now we have lots, and we have lots of first-gen students and students of color from no, Brooklyn and the Bronx, especially. And I remember them just the last time I was teaching uh, a year ago. And I was teaching, you know, the black, how African Americans participated in on different sides of the American Revolution. And I remember these students saying to me, um, black students saying, we didn't learn any of this. And I remember I said, wait, you're in Brooklyn? And you didn't learn any of this about, I mean, there's so much there, so much black history way before me. Like I said, Craig Wilder, Graham Hodges, lots of stuff. And they said, not a bit of it. We just learned the straight up, you know, Washington Valley Forge history I learned in the 1960s. So I think that New York history should put black history as one of its main central lines, because after all, greater New York City was one of the most important slave holding areas of the country at the time of the revolution. Um, the majority of farmers, the Dutch farmers used in slave labor. So that should be in there. That's, that's the first thing. Forget Goss's contribution that, that, um, there were in certain respects, greater New York in the late 18th century was actually a slave society. That's what I want to see. And that's not my contribution. That's Craig Wilder and Graham Hodges and others, okay? So <laughs> that would really, you know, shake it up. Like Prospect Park, the, 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 uh, the manor that you see there in Prospect Park, all of that, all of the big families, the big Dutch families, whose names are all over the city, we still see their names, Van Cortland, all of these names all over, all of those families own dozens of enslaved people. That's the history. But then we can get to you know, what happens as emancipation slowly proceeds. Obviously, we should also be teaching, and this is not my stuff, that emancipation only concludes in 1827, and there's still 4,000 enslaved people. One of my favorite ways of getting at this, now we're talking about pedagogy, not my stuff, okay, is reminding people who Sojourner, Sojourner Truth was. And Isabel, I always get her name wrong. I think I want to say Van Wagenen, but it's not that. It's Isabel, it's a Dutch name. She's born on a, in 1814 on the Dutch farmers, uh, how, you know, slave labor camp up the Hudson. She grows up speaking Dutch. She is an enslaved woman until emancipation. Use Sojourner Truth, her real life, what that means. Um, and I say this as someone, you know, the van in my name, I'm one of those old Dutch New Yorkers all the way back in Schenectady, all the way back. And I, I've actually never quite, you know, dug it out. I tend to assume that those ancestors, the Van den Bogerts, probably owned enslaved people because most of them did. So, which is uh, shameful for my family and a subject we have avoided, shall we say. So, um, getting at the involvement in enslavement, how difficult emancipation was, but also the extraordinary level of black agency. That's what I'd like to see incorporated into New York history for everyone, every one of our ninth graders that's the year studying. Um, okay. Um, I would also say, I think it's Nell Painter. She has that wonderful book on Sojourner Truth, which I think really gets at um, what you're talking about. And also earlier, you mentioned the book on um, the ACS and just Liberian colonization by Claude Clegg. Um, it was the price of liberty. Um, it just came to me. So uh, do you have anything in mind for you know, your next book project, or is it too soon? 
you just wrapped too, so. Oh, um, yeah, this one took a very long time. Well, I mean, I, you know, I have all this research, which obviously the, you know, can, can, there's a lot more that has been written about black politics. The politics that I'm describing, parties and voting and power, power in and around the state, patronage, all of that. I still have all this, this um, a lot of research from you know, 1877 into the 20th century. Huge untold stories, uh, you know, the, the Republican machine in Memphis, which was where black men were not disfranchised. That would be an example. And, you know, there's some great books on Memphis, including black history, but they actually, Michael Honey's a great historian. And it's odd because, um, you know, Robert R. Church, the first real black millionaire, he controlled all patronage in Memphis for decades, as long as Republicans were in power. That story contradicts Jim Crow, right? Anyway, just an example. Whether I'm going to write that book, I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm a little, uh, I don't know, I want a break. So I've got a project that I'm, I never discussed anywhere. Um, I'm thinking about writing uh, a young adult novel. The title would be The Bottom Rail. The Bottom Rail from C. Van Woodward, The Bottom Rail on Top, oh. describing the populace, the biracial populace, The Bottom Rail. It's the American version of the world turned upside down, the metaphoric revolution, The Bottom Rail on Top. And the subtitle would be A Tale of Black Liberation. All of this could change. I don't know if I'm going to write this book. I have a couple of chapters. And it's basically the, 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 the dream of what Reconstruction might have been. Wow. Um, the Black Republics. The Black Republic thesis carried out. That sounds you know. really interesting. And I'm definitely unexpected. Well, it'd be a why. I mean, it would be, you know, we're not supposed to do speculative <laughs> stuff, but why not? Yeah. You know, it's, it's so I'll say one. This is about seven years ago. I wrote a short story because I just I don't know. I felt like it. The title of the short story is Frederick Douglass meets the Queen. Did it? Where where can we find that? Well, I don't know. I used I put it up in my HuffPost blog, okay. but I don't know if it's still there. I don't know if it all got you know HuffPost shut down. I mean, I'll be happy to send it to you. It's just sitting there. And then I and then I wrote another one in which, I mean, if people know about Harriet Tubman's Combahee, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Combahee, Combahee River Raid, this extraordinary, I mean, her leading a, an entire regiment up the Combahee River to free hundreds of slaves. It's in the movie. It's just remarkable. But I took it a step further, and in this other story I wrote, she has been captured. She, they, they have a lot of trouble capturing her. She takes some of them with her, because, you know, she had that big pistol, right? Um, but she's sitting in a jail because they're, you know, they're going to try her and she's, um, anyway, you can see I'm, I get excited about this, but I'm, I think I'm going to try to do this novel where things, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not about defeat, it's about victory. Awesome. Thank you so much for speaking with the Gotham Center for New York City History and the New Books Network. Thank you. Thank you.